Hey, Horns, can you grab me a beer from the basement? Yeah, actually, I uh, just went down there and I got you one, but I'm a little concerned. There's a lot of weird shit. Like, you have uh, this but, creepy but, but, No, 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 no. That, thanks for the Zima. I bit a kid once. What the fuck? What is wrong with you? Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we're just a bunch of bros drinking beer and watching TV and movies. This is our review of WandaVision, Episode 7, and I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek, joined by the American hero, Nate Thurman, and the mad scientist, Brian Banner, to review this episode as we do all of our TV episodes on the four Bro Four Squad criteria, which is the acting, the story, our favorite scene, and then any theories or questions going forward. So, Nate, we'll toss it to you first. Episode 7 gave us a more, probably the most updated look at the sitcom world that we'll get in this show, I would imagine, unless they want to, like, project what sitcoms will be in like, the next <laughs> 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and was a very interesting dynamic as far as performances went. What did you think, good or bad, what stood out to you? Um, yeah, for the performances and acting, I thought... There were a couple of good performances that stood out on this one um, in a relatively mundane episode. But um, Catherine Hahn really loved her coming out. And there was a ton with her that really kind of um, drove home why she's been excelling in like in a sitcom format like this. Um, but a ton of Jen Barkley vibes from Parks and Rec. Like kind of, kind of at the very end, obviously when she was coming out um, as Agatha Harkness, but um, really that kind of funny cockiness um, yes. overall, especially in the the music video, the video montage for the intro. But um, she's really who stood out on that one. It was really good. There are a lot of things that I feel like the writers, like when they put it on page with this series, they're like, dude, this might crash and burn badly. And the like musical montage at the end where it says Agatha was behind this all along. I could just see in a pitch meeting Kevin Feige going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and they go, but we're going to have Catherine Hahn. And he's like, all right, she can maybe pull it off. All right, I think it can work. That's the I one almost feel like in some of these scenarios, like they had the general picture of what they wanted to do. But then they wrote after these, these characters have been cast. So they knew they had Catherine Hahn. They go, okay, we're going to change all of this because she's the only person on the planet that can pull this off. And in the comics, Agatha Harkness is every depiction I've seen. She's like 90 years old. So yeah. they had to make the creative decision to age her down a lot for the purpose of this. And I think even though we haven't seen it come to fruition, it paid dividends. Banner, segueing off of that, who, uh, who stood out to you in this episode? So, what's his name? The guy that plays Jimmy Wu, Anthony something? Uh, Anthony Park. Or Randall Park. Randall Park. Randall Park. Yeah, yeah. yeah I knew it was something, Anthony. He fucking sucked. It's not Anthony, though. At <laughs> it's <all>. not. <laughs> he sucked? I thought he was terrible in this episode. Like, when why? you have a little bit to... From... I don't know. Just, like, him running, like, no, Monica, don't run in there. It, I got a lot of, like, Ja Rule vibe from Fast and the Furious. Okay, Ja That's Rule's in, weird. like, half of one Fast and the Furious movie, and all he does is yell Monica. My point exactly. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> you it's made my simple, point for It's me. a very simple point. <laughs> uh, no, Catherine Hahn uh, definitely was a standout for this. <clears throat> and this, I don't want to say Elizabeth Olsen was a standout, but this really drove home her versatility she has now hit every decade from what the 50s we'd say in sitcom world as well as playing a superhero all mixed up into one yeah and this episode with the the you know west view we'll talk about why it was probably fading in and out but happening much earlier in the sitcom experience than we've seen in previous episodes she has to go from 
breaking the fourth wall type trope, which I think is difficult enough in the sitcom to like actually being freaked out by what's happening around her in the same sentence sometimes, which is pretty difficult to execute, Mm -hmm. I think. Yep. Last thing I'll point out, just because I thought their dynamic was awesome, and this is, I think, one thing the Disney Plus shows are really going to give us, are, like, pairings of characters in the MCU that we maybe never envisioned together. But uh, Vision and Darcy in this episode were hilarious to me. Oh, yeah. Like, them so just good. driving, them just basically being on, like, a road trip. I'm like, this is, like, a dream I would have and be like, oh, that would be kind of cool to see. Yeah, and they, they get this. matched up. Right, because it's like such an improbable pairing. Yeah. But I'm starting to learn that Paul Bettany, and we've said this earlier, he's just so underrated because you can, he can literally do anything. Like he can pair with anyone. He can be the straight man. He can be the you know outlandish loud guy. And his voice is just incredible for some reason. It adds this comedic element to things. And he had my quote of the episode, uh, which actually, is this my best scene? Yeah, that's my best scene. So I'll save it for that. Okay. Nice. Anything else before we move on to story and plot? Uh, last thing I'll say is I think the kid that plays Wiccan, I don't know if that's Billy or Tommy. I, I always get them confused. Um, I think that kid's really good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always talk about how hard it is to cast kid kid actors. And I think, I mean, I think both boys did a really good job, but the kid that plays Wiccan really is standing out to me. I think they may have a future with future projects with him. Yeah. And, uh, it looks like, you know, the next five years are setting up Young Avengers. So, again, depending what their timeline is for aging these kids up, maybe these guys will be around. I don't know. But I would like to see that. All right, on to, I don't know if we normally do story or scene second, but we'll get to all the categories, people at home. So we'll just go to story and plot next. And according to IMDB, the plot synopsis is Monica plots her return. Wanda navigates unsettling complications and vision forms a new alliance. And we really did have sort of three storylines. It was outside of the hex, which didn't focus on sword much at all. I want to say I could be wrong. Hayward only had like one brief scene. Yeah, it was really quick. Yeah. There wasn't much of him at all. Yeah. And then it was Monica, Jimmy, and uh, obviously her, her friends, which we'll talk about. And then of course, what's happening inside the hex, which uh, seemed to sort of, reveal where they're going with the end of the show although i'll still feel like they have one trick up their sleeve but banner what do you think of the story plot here in episode seven um for being kind of a mediocre just a this is the calm before the storm i feel like we've got two episodes left after this for sure this was an episode that just kind of said hey look we're gonna take a step back we're gonna chill out before we throw all this stuff at you but we're gonna give you a little bit um, yeah, it was kind of a setup episode. Yeah, it was definitely like a like a setup episode. They kind of brought us in. And they said, "Okay, look, we know Wanda's going fucking nuts. All right, we can see the crazy in her eyes. She don't give a fuck, and she don't give a fuck. And we have Vision clearly coming to terms with what happened uh, through the events of Infinity War and Endgame, and kind of realizing like, hey, I I don't think I should be here." Um, so and then then obviously you have Darcy kind of being his therapist, if you will, like, yeah, this is what happened or not, not even therapist, just explaining what has happened over the course of time since he can't remember anything. And the great thing about Darcy is throughout her MCU tenure, she will be unfazed by whatever's happening around her. A hundred percent. And like, and she has grown. Her character isn't. I don't know if this is the right terminology, but she's not as immature as she was when we first met her in Thor. Yeah, for sure. Very true. Nate, did you want to add anything to what he was saying about Darcy and Vision? Yeah, so like you're, you're saying they're just having this casual, nonchalant conversation, which that was kind of one interesting part of the whole episode because they're getting more and more to the point where they're discussing like these very horrific or um, yeah. emotional moments, like him dying twice. But they're just kind of, you know, chatting about it just like it's normal and everything. So just shooting the shit, man. It's like a really good way of tying in like the overall Marvel universe and Marvel theme together, but then putting it in the sitcom form. And it's yes. kind of cool. I mean, it's coming to culmination, like especially this episode because there was so much of it. But yeah, just, oh yeah, you died and then kind of came back to life and blah, blah, blah. Oh, cool. And then they repair the traffic light in front of them and you're like, yeah. <laughs> somehow this works. It could be a mish- like a hodgepodge of genre and weird dialogue but it doesn't feel weird i don't know maybe because they've committed so much to the 
framing device of this show that at this point we just like totally accept it because it's genius. And I think that that's the whole thing. I mean, if I'm honestly, if I'm being honest with myself, I still don't know what the fuck is going on in this show, but I really like it. But I think there's, so there's times where like True Detective season two, I didn't know what the fuck was going on and I was very annoyed and confused. I think there's a, in a weird way, I don't know if I'll articulate this, you cannot know what's going on, but not be confused, be like more interested. And that's kind of where I'm yeah, intrigued. Show. Yeah, it's it's more of like exactly like Nate said. I'm intrigued and less like, dude, who the fuck is that? What is this? Like, yeah, because I I trust Marvel to pay off everything they've set up. Yeah, they will. Now speaking of that, Nate, you can't build a lineup with nine Adam Duns, right? You can't have guys that just swing for the fence every time. You got to have people that strikeouts get on, a season, right? You got to have people that get on base, that steal bases, that hit singles. And this episode, especially knowing that we only have two left after it, it was, I don't want to say frustrating or a letdown, but I have such a high expectation for what this show is going to do week to week. And this one, again, didn't fall short of that mark, but it definitely did feel like it was really just putting the pieces in position for the end of the series, yeah. the last two episodes. Did you feel the same way or were you kind of frustrated with where this one left us? Yeah, so kind of the the movement forward and the plot was frustrating. But as I kind of thought about it more and uh, was thinking about the entire episode, like the the guts of the episode were, were good and like all the acting and the genres, like we said, are mixing together. But, yeah, it was kind of mundane as far as actually progressing the plot forward. Um, we kind of it's kind of like I said earlier, it's kind of like a setup episode. And we kind of came to some reveals that we kind of already knew, like Agatha being uh, Agatha, uh, Agnes being Agatha uh, Harkness. Yeah. Um, and then they were really going in on like the blue eyes of Rambo a lot. We're like, okay, we kind of see she's becoming a superhero and all this kind of stuff. So right. there were, there were some reveals that we kind of knew about already, but, um, they confirmed a lot of our suspicions. Exactly. Yeah. But as far as like the structure of the episode and everything that was great, obviously the episode name being breaking the fourth wall, they did that a lot. And, it was kind of a cool dynamic going that direction because of where they're at in the story and people are starting to be more truthful and being honest, which is exactly what they do in floating heads and like mm -hmm. the office from modern family. So that was a nice connection to how they tied that in. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think, I mean, if every episode is mind blowing, then kind of none of them are in a weird way. Yeah. And so there are important, especially like when you look back, I know the, with the weekly format, like if you were binging this show that we wouldn't really feel the effects of this as much, but it is a nice sort of like take your breath episode before the end. And to their point, like the Agatha Harkness thing in the days, and this is a moment, memory of the past, but in the days before the internet and rampant speculation, that might've been a really cool reveal. And I didn't not mm -hmm. enjoy it, but we guess on this, we have a whole segment on this podcast of theories and questions we guess fucking everything at one point. So, yeah, like it's not Marvel's fault that we kind of jumped out in front of one of these things. And yeah, yeah I mean, really when, happen. when you when you swing 100 percent of the time, you're bound to hit a foul ball once. Right. It's the yeah. Mark Reynolds, Adam Dunn philosophy. Exactly. Right? Well, if I try to hit a home run on every swing, all I have to do is be correct 30 times a year and I make 20 million dollars. It's kind of a fun. <laughs> yeah. Fun proposition and the last thing on the agatha thing like i think that is a testament to marvel too because i think they knew that the audience was going to catch on to that i mean they're pretty being pretty obvious about it I was so they, say, they have, didn't hide it but they didn't no. not hide it either so then they had fun with the reveal with that like new intro which i thought Very was kind of like and like even another like intro to another sitcom because they had um yeah. agnes did it all or knew along or whatever it was like the title of the show starring her and all that kind of stuff, but they had fun with it. So I, I think that was kind of cool that they did that. And I just saw this online, but her house, uh, is painted as and designed. It's the same house from bewitched. Oh, nice. Just kind of, like oh, if you look sweet. at the, the paint yeah. on the outside. All right. Anything else? We're ready to move on to best scene. Um, let's, let's see. see here. Oh, the one thing that I, did want to point out it was a small thing. Whenever um, all the agents get sucked into the bubble, it's funny. Most of them are clowns. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was really good. And Darcy being handcuffed turns into the escape artist. Yes. She was handcuffed the the car. Very clever. Like very nice. That. Yeah, that was good. The small things. Yeah. But anyways, I'm good now. 
So speaking of best scene, my, I'll just take the ball and run with it because mine goes right into that Darcy being the escape artist. Uh, again, Darcy and Vision this episode were hilarious. I could do like a whole like six shorts with them just kind of on the road or whatever scenario you want to put them in. But <laughs> there was a line that I actually had to pause it because I was laughing so hard. I was like, I'm going to miss something. Paul Bettany, when Vision and Darcy are like driving away from the circus mm -hmm. in that truck to get away from the ringleader guy who was part of sword i don't know if you guys caught this i really only picked up on it because i had the subtitles on but my favorite line maybe comedically of the whole series was when, when the guy's screaming at paul bettany and darcy to come back because they have to work at the circus and and vision says i'm sorry our agent double booked us <laughs> as they're like pulling out it's the most ridiculous fucking excuse that vision could come up with on the fly and i was just like <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you even saying? Uh, yeah. It's just utterly ridiculous. And in a show where they need to go from like zero to 100 real quick, like they need to go from that to Vision and Darcy talking about him dying two times in front of the woman he loves most. Yeah. How do they pull this off? Like, again, it could become an absolute fucking mess if it's not executed properly. And I laughed at that moment. And then the moment Banner mentioned earlier, I was in my feels again thinking about Vision saying in Infinity War, all I feel is you, as Wanda kills him. It was just like, good job, show. Yep. Well done. <laughs> you, you did what you were supposed to do. Yeah. Nate, how about you? What was your favorite scene? Um, I'll kind of go back to what I was talking about earlier. That, well, that in and of itself, what Horns was talking about, was a great scene, obviously. Uh, but really, um, what I was saying earlier, kind of in the plot and story with Ag uh, Agnes's intro scene, um, that was probably one of my favorite damn catchy tune, by the way, super catchy. Yeah. I had heard my dad loved this show. I don't re really remember the theme song, but apparently it was kind of a riff on the monsters theme song. Oh, oh nice. Right. nice. Which again, the um, show just gets it and pays homage to all yeah. the classics. And, um, the, the music, I think they've been tied into, um, some of the other shows as well, but, um, Obviously, the theme song of that one made that scene kind of great in the montage and everything. And at the very end, delivering the line, I killed Sparky, too. Come on. Wow. Jesus. Yeah. That That's just like holding his core. Just fucking savage. Head. Yeah. Um, but but to it the worked. Credit, like we said, it's yeah. fucked up, but it worked. Yeah. They put it into a funny sitcom form, and I was like, That's actually okay. That's pretty dark. Um, but what also made kind of that scene was that catchy tune and, and theme song. And the people who wrote that were um, Robert Lopez and – hold on. His wife, who they're Mrs. both Lopez? like writers. Yes. <gasps> but they, they've written songs for Frozen 2, Coco, Frozen. Holy shit. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. But I just want to add that in there because that was part of one of my favorite scenes. Imagine getting that call. Like it's weird what we need you to write, but just yeah. bear with us. And Kristen Banner, you're Anderson on a, Lopez, that's that's his wife. Banner, you're on a last name basis with her. That must be pretty serious. Yeah. But um, anyways, like I said, fun in, in introduction to Agatha. Good music, catchy. And then it was just killer at the end with the sparky line. And also, Nate, something to that scene, and this uh, will probably lead us after Banner goes into theories and questions pretty well, but to reveal Agnes as the the... I'll just say N antagonist right now, I think does two things. Yeah. Number one, it's nice as fans to have confirmation of something. Like we don't want all the reveals in the finale, right? Like let us know, you know, I mean, they've laid enough uh, breadcrumbs to be like, all right, here's your payoff. And two, and again, we don't need to talk about this just yet, but I don't think she's the main antagonist because we got this reveal right now. I agree a hundred percent. Agree with that, and like your theory last pod with Ultron, I would, there's a strong likelihood behind that. And more. Ultron was mentioned this episode, so there's even more, there might be more meat to that than what we originally thought. We'll get yeah. to that in a few minutes. For yeah, sure. They've been on Ultron's dick this whole series, and I'm not complaining, but like he's been referenced way more than I thought going into this. Banner, what was your favorite scene? I think my favorite scene was the end scene with Ag with them doing the whole theme song for uh, Agatha Harkness. But I think the best scene and what I want to talk about is the, uh, as I was quickly corrected this evening, 
the mid credit scene, not the mm-hmm. end credit scene. Um, that was when they said, "Hey, look, we know this was a mediocre episode, but we're gonna give you what our, what you want, and we're gonna still pull you along and tease you." As Marvel has done literally since 2008 in Iron Man when they did an end credit scene. We are just a spoiled society now where we expect an end credit scene. And when we don't get one, we're like, well, what the fuck? Right? So now we got one. I have no fucking clue if Pietro... I don't think the multiverse has been open now. Yeah, we'll get into that. I- I'm just glad that they showed him again. My biggest fear is that they would just not have him ever in the show again and never even bring it up. And I'd be like, what the fuck was that then? Yeah. Hmm. So I'm at, <clears throat> I'm at least relieved he's still around. I thought that was a, it was really small. It was really just, I don't want to say insignificant to the overall episode, but that was Marvel showing us like, hey, look, we're still Marvel. We can still do an end credit scene. And say, hey, look, you're going to be excited about next week. Don't worry. Yeah, because I think we had, I think, kind of all come to agreement earlier that the only episode with an end credit scene on this show would be the finale or like the end of the series. Yeah. So they did kind of surprise there. And do you it, think would... we're going to get one? Well, we'll wait. We'll wait till questions and theories. I don't even know. All right. Are and you guys there? have anything else before we move on to the theories and questions portion? Of Let's move on. All right, let's do it. Banner, since you have the ball already, what do you want to lead off with for theories and questions? So first off, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that the multiverse has been open yet. Why is that? Because I don't, I feel like all of this, like Wanda is clearly, they have made that very clear. We know Wanda is making this reality, right? She is controlling all these people, but I don't know that. Allegedly. Allegedly. I mean, she's saying that she has because she's sitting there going, look, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Well, so like, she was, it looked like under some sort of mind control from Agnes. At the but end. now yeah. I'm thinking she may be under mind control from Agnes. So Agnes is telling her to create this reality. And I don't even think Agnes is in charge. So there we go. Just Agnes like, is Tatsu. She's fucking middle management, man. She wishes she was Tatsu. <laughs> I, I don't think the multiverse has been opened yet. So. I don't either. I don't know what this Quicksilver mm-hmm. is, but I'm sitting here with my arms folded. Marvel is playing with fire, and they better not fuck with me. Like, I don't want a Mandarin-type twist where they bring back the guy who played Quicksilver, which, by the way, say what you want about the Fox X-Men movies, and Banner, you know this. Evan Peters was raved about and lauded for his performance. As Oh, he... People, obviously, because they came out the same year, they put him and, uh, uh, what's his name? Aaron Taylor Johnson. Thank you. Aaron Taylor Johnson, side by side. I would say nine out of ten dentists would pick Evan Peters. (laughs) ADA approved. Correct. He was the better Quicksilver. And uh, so if they do something where they bring back, and we talked about this earlier in the series, but the exact person who played him, like, just basically to pull the wool over our eyes and be like, no, but it's not that Pietro. Then I would say, then cast fucking Nate as Quicksilver, I'm, right? I'm Don't free. Exactly. He Nate can't pull that hair off. The well, Don't, we could try with enough hairspray and enough effort. Yeah, but that's my thing. Don't bring back that actor then to play the character if it's not going to be that <laughs> character, right? Nate, what do you think about Quicksilver? Sorry to like throw you a theory before you even get to speak, but I need to know. Um, the only thing that I can think about Pietro right now is whatever Vision's state is right now, it's go- it's going to be Pietro's state right now. Like, and by saying that, I mean like, can he survive outside the bubble? Did Wanda or Agnes actually bring him back to life? Is he alive? Is he just a puppet? That's really the only thing I really feel strongly about is whatever is happening to vision is happening to Pietro too. So they're kind of in the same boat as far as are they alive? Are they dead? Kind of that state. So then my question becomes, because we did see at the Halloween festival, Wanda had like a, I I don't know what we want to call it. A moment where she sort of like loses her 
fake reality and sees the real person. She saw the bullet holes in old Pietro's body. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is this a reanimated version of his corpse from Age of Ultron? But how does she get the image of Fox Quicksilver to even reanimate him as such if it's not him? It's got to be Agnes, right? So maybe Agnes has gone through the multiverse before, so she knows. Or the Nexus, which we can get into, which in the yeah. comics is the thing that bridges all the realities, basically opens the multiverse, yeah. which so- with- commercial here so agnes knows the other pietro and, and she's like oh fuck shit i didn't know the other one looked different that is the fucking move right there <laughs> right yeah. there yeah there okay. it is can we get you in the writer's room retroactively because that's <laughs> i'm fine with that i'm fine with any scenario and they could even fucking kill him off again that's fine but one thing that i can't tolerate is the mandarin one where they say up, oh, it's it's not this pietro or the other one he was just an imagination and we thought it would be a nice nod to fans to cast the other actor because to me that's just a middle finger that's not a nod to fans if that's what no. you do yeah not at all yeah, that's just that <laughs> is that you coughing or questioning the <laughs> both uh, they're they are going to bring other actors in from the foxverse they have to we know deadpool's coming in right yeah so it just doesn't make sense and we know marvel doesn't do things unintentionally ever so it doesn't make sense that he's in there just as a nod or as a hey here he is nate before i I let you jump in i actually banner's segueing in perfectly to a quote that i screenshotted that paul bettany gave to variety about that same thing and it says this quote There is this theory that says there's a mysterious Avenger who's going to appear in WandaVision, and people seem to think that mysterious Avenger is Doctor Strange. Truth is, of all the characters we were trying to keep secret, a lot of them got out before release. There's one character that has not been revealed, and it's very exciting. It's an actor I've longed to work with all my life. We have some amazing scenes together, and the chemistry is extraordinary. End quote. Now, again, I've said I will still bet my life that benedict cumberbatch shows up at some point but he never worked with benedict cumberbatch right but he's not alluding to him there because he says people say there's this mysterious avenger i don't think that would be like a jaw-dropping cameo i think we're getting an ian mckellen or a fossbender in this as it's got to be a fossbender like as the second one to walk through the because banner like you said you don't think the multiverse is ripped open one guy coming through could be a fluke two guys is a trend right of course nate what do you make of that quote yeah, that could be it. Um, those are pretty strong words by Mr. Bettany. Yeah. I trust him, though. I do. He, I mean, he has a British accent. I'm going to trust what he says. I don't care what it is. He could fuck my wife. I don't care. Yeah. British, so. uh, Bettany, what's up, man? <laughs> he pulled off marrying Jennifer Garner, so clearly he's... Not Jennifer uh, Garner, Jennifer Connelly, excuse me. I was about to say, I was like, I didn't know they were married. Interesting. That works quick. <laughs> yeah. All right, we can speculate on that probably more next week. Nate, I haven't let you talk yet. I'm sorry. What are your theories or questions that are burning through your skull? It's fine. For the most part, I didn't have too many. Um, because I feel like any theories that we've made in the past that haven't been revealed, I'm kind of still chugging along on those, which I like. Um, but we're getting close enough to the end to where a lot of things have been answered on some of the theories. But my small one is that um, the twins are gone. So... Wanda comes in, Agnes, oh, they're probably playing in the basement. I don't think they were playing in the basement. This, this, they were tied up somewhere and we didn't see them. But um, I think that she turned one of them into the rabbit that was sitting by the couch. And then Wanda turns and looks to the left and sees a fly or a cicada is kind of mm-hmm. on, the, on the drapes there. And I think she turned each of them into one of those animals. And it kind of makes sense because a rabbit is fast and quick. The fly on the wall can see everything. Here's everything. Damn. (laughs) That's really good. Wow. That was, that was the one thing I had. It's it's not big, but it'd be kind of cool. So real quick. And I didn't know this. I read online. This is pretty weak, but I've abandoned the Mephisto is involved theory. He still might be. Um, But she calls the rabbit Mr. Scratchy or Senior Scratchy. Senior Scratchy. Senior Scratchy. Apparently, Scratch is a pseudonym or a nickname for the devil. I, saw, I actually saw that somewhere online really? too. I had never heard that. I was like, huh? I hadn't that's either. Interesting. 
So some people are saying maybe the rabbit is either Mephisto or Ralph, who is like her husband, who she turned into a rabbit. Yeah. But that seems like a stretch. I like Nate's theory much better, especially because in the comics, there is an arc. And it's one of my least favorite comic arcs, but it's uh, from uh, Wanda and Vision where they're like living in the suburbs, sort of like this show. But this has given me much more House of M vibes where Agatha Harkness tries to kidnap Speed and Wiccan. Hmm. And basically use them for her own devices which is kind of more in line with your theory which I, I has been much more uh synchronous to what the show has done yeah yeah um but yeah that's all i had on that all right i have Wait, to ask agatha you. be teaching wiccan to use his powers possibly um and also they have they have an interesting interaction on the on the couch too which another really back. good scene yeah, it goes back to our theory of, or just question of like, are they alive? Are they kind of uh, amalgamations of Wanda's um, own making? But now we're seeing it may have been Ag- Agnes who's controlling everything. But uh, one of the kids kind of asks, um, there's like, I feel emptiness or darkness or whatever he said, like inside. It was like, it's kind of weird. Like if she's controlling it, why is he asking her these things? But yeah. I don't know what's happening with the kids, man. I'm still still in the um, I have a question sort of unrelated that I'm again I'm nervous about. But was uh Major Go- Goodner who was uh who? The, Major Goodner was the army yes, Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the person in the army who gave uh Monica the rover. Please tell me that's not the aerospace engineer we've There's no fucking way of. it's the aerospace engineer. But no way. So then, where is that eating. person? I don't. Right, I don't get it. Oh man, I, I don't. I don't even know what to say about that. Yeah, because after um, uh, I can't remember Monica Rambo's name in life. Paris. Tiana Paris. Her quote. Yeah. I'm like, what the f- exactly? We quote. talked about this off pod, and they're like, oh man, that's cool. There's going to be a big reveal with the aerospace engineer. Nothing. And again, these don't have to be monumental reveals, but don't tease them as such. Yeah, exactly. This is the first red herring we've had in the Marvel Universe, right? I mean, Uh, that's a a big statement. That's a stretch. But yes, in the show, there there was a lot of buzz on the internet, obviously. But um, even with the show, I feel like they kind of put those pieces in there to like kind of tickle your balls a little bit. And then we're like, oh, this is it. Okay. But again, if that's not like, how does the aerospace engineer show up again in the show? Like, I don't, that was their moment to, like Nate said, that they were meeting the people she was texting. So, I, yeah. And they made it seem like Goodner. She was like, thanks for doing this for me. And she was like, I owe your mother a favor. So, I don't know. I hope that's no offense to the actor who played her or the character Goodner, who, yeah. Again, I'm not like the most diehard comics fan. I have seen a woman naked in real life, but. I don't know who that character is. Never heard of her. So same, same. I don't know. I hope that's not it. And I didn't need more, but they kind of told me there was. It's like a Ryan Johnson scenario. Don't tell me something cool is going to happen and then it doesn't. That's. Don't tell me the last three episodes are going to be an hour and they're not. Right. That was a whole nother. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was very <laughs> disappointing. It's like, how do you not think I'm going to figure that out next week? Like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah. Banner, what else you got? Uh. That's all I got really off the top of my head. I think all of my other theories are still in in place. Um, whether they're probable or not, probably not. But I think the X-Men are going to show up in some form. I think getting Fosbender is a real possibility. I don't know how that he would be incorporated into future known projects, though. And that's really where I'm getting hung up on the X-Men. Where are they going to fit into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse and the next Spider-Man movie? And how are they? I think he froze. Mm. But that's okay. I, I have a theory sort of tying into that around the multiverse. I think it is going to be a three-project arc, the multiverse. It'll start with WandaVision. It'll continue in Spider-Man he's... 3. Oh, he's back. It'll continue in Spider-Man 3, and then they will close it off in Doctor Strange. So it's not something that's going to be around for all of Phase 4 and 5. It'll be like kind of a, not a blip on the radar in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it won't be something that they have to deal with for the next 10 years. 
It'll kind of be self-contained, is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Because Kevin Feige did that. say, Kevin Feige did say, WandaVision, Spider-Man Three, and Doctor Strange are essentially like telling the same story. Not the same story, but it connects. Solid. Okay. Ben, there are a few like... things I wanted to bring up briefly about Agnes. Um, was that book in her basement, The Dark Hold? We brought this up earlier in the series. They made a point for the camera to focus on it. I mean, that I... would be a direct connection to Doctor Strange. Did she take that from a sanctum? sanctum? I mean, I, I feel like she has to, right? Like, they wouldn't have... We've said it... If we, if we said it once, we've said it a hundred times. Marvel doesn't do anything by accident. Everything is placed there on purpose. They purposely zoomed in and almost illuminated it a little bit where I feel like it has to have come from a sanctum. I literally have on my notes for this episode, everything means something. Which is, <laughs> yes. let's all get tattoos of that on our dicks. Everything, okay, I'm in. I, I may even be able to get like vision. EVE, but yeah, I was going to say maybe when I'm an adult and I have more penis to work with, they can finish it. Um, but the dark hold, if you're kind of the, just the, the MCU fan watching it, who again has felt the touch of a woman and doesn't know all the nerdy stuff. It's basically just means that, uh, she's working with dark magic. It's like an evil spell book that the, uh, sorcerer Supremes or the, you know, Dr. Strange and the sanctums keep, from enemy sorcerers. I actually think in the first Doctor Strange, Kaecilius, played by Mads Mikkelsen, is trying to get it from them. I yeah, could... I think I think he actually steals a page out of it. That sounds correct. Which was the whole thing, because he wants to bring Dormammu back. Yeah. The only other thing I had, Nate touched on this earlier, I, even though he was only in one scene this episode, I still feel good, if not even a little bit better, that Hayward is Ultron. Mm -hmm. or working for Ultron, or some... Yeah, I, I think he's going to be the ultimate antagonist. I think you are correct. I think he is in some way connected to Ultron. He has to be. The way that he is tracking Vision's uh, vibranium synthesoid body and is essentially obsessed with it, he yeah. has to be, right? Yes, and th that... Uh... That wouldn't even be the person Paul Bettany's referencing because Bettany had a couple scenes with Ultron and Spader in yeah. Avengers Age of Ultron. Yeah. So I think Fosbender is – I think there's a real po big possibility we get Fosbender. Now, the – and there are a lot of people probably screaming, oh, Patrick Stewart, Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart did confirm <laughs> in a couple interviews that he met with Kevin Feige about two years ago about bringing Xavier back. I think they were photographed at like a restaurant together. But he said that uh, he ultimately declined because he just felt so good about the way Logan had ended his character. I don't know if it was mm -hmm. this project or something else. And again, he could be lying, but he's Sir Patrick Stewart. So like Nate, he wouldn't lie his to us. British accent, we have to take his word for it. It's the truth. Was I, I, don't want, I don't want to see Professor X again. Yeah, he had a pretty good character arc. And with Logan. All right, that's all I got. You guys have anything else before we let people go? Um, nope. Just in the wise words of Mitch Hedberg, rice is great if you're hungry and want to eat 2,000 or something. <laughs> Gone but never forgotten. Yes. Big time rip. Painter, how about you? Uh, I can't live up to that. We're just going to live that. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, he really Just bow out. Yeah. It's impossible. All right, for the American hero, Nate Thurmond, and the mad scientist, Brian Banner, I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and we are the Bro4 Squad Podcast. Thank you guys for checking us out. we got two more weeks of WandaVision. We hope to see you for our reviews for those last two episodes. I'm pretty excited for where this thing's going to end up. Please follow us on Twitter at Bro4 Squad. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. If you type in Bro4 Squad as three separate words, you'll find us there. And check out everything that we've done and that we currently post on our website, broforsquad.com. Till next time, we'll see you at the circus. Ben, are you and actually bit a kid? <laughs> yeah, like three times, but it's whatever. I know this is recorded, right? I never bit a kid. <laughs> Twice. Saved it. <laughs> <laughs>